Green had a great Christmas. And you know, our good testimony, how the people got blessed. And, uh, you know, and I was thinking, a lot of times we get blessed every day and don't even know it. Driving down the highway and, and uh, we uh, the car keeps going. And we come across the river and someone else is not us. Time we get up in the morning, they will get up and, and get out and go bless. And uh, so, the uh, Lord see you in the blessing business. All right. Father, this morning, as we lift up our offer to you, Father, we do thank you for the many blessings that, that you bestow upon us a lot of times we don't even see or realize. Father, that we just thank you, Lord, and the thanks for those that you. I bring you tomorrow yes. and those that you brought today. Father, we ask you to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, let's shout to the Lord today. Shout to the Lord of the
bulletin it says trust God and that's where we're at today trust in the Lord with all your heart and not to your own understanding we have some scriptures on our heart go with us today my question today is in whom do you trust in whom do you trust that makes a lot of difference do we trust in our car when we go out to get into it and uh, and to drive it somewhere can't always trust it, can you? It can fail. But Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. You might as well get in behind me, Satan. Your word is not the truth. <laughs> For Jesus never fails. Oh, Amen. Jesus, you're the really answer. You're the answer. And who do we trust today? <laughs> Woo! Somebody get happy today. Hallelujah. He is here. Psalms 20. That's what we're doing to that. Psalms 20. Verse 6, first of all. Then we'll read verse 7 through on down the ways. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. David is surrounded by a multitude of enemies and hating. David, this is Psalmist David we're, we're hearing from here. And his enemies have been surrounded. They hate him with a passion. He needs supernatural help. 
Somebody say, we need supernatural help from the Lord our God. Hallelujah. God knows all about it. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows exactly what we're going through. He knows more than we know. <laughs> now, he knows it all. And so, with his knowledge, here we, we find that David says, God, I know you are real, and I'm trusting in you, and you're coming through with the saving strength of your right hand. Is that in that scripture I just read? With the saving strength of your right hand. Now, what is this? The hand represents his power. The hand does. The right hand represents his almighty power. Somebody shout, yeah. yeah. Hallelujah. The strength of his right hand is his almighty power in action. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was sitting, eating last night, and someone had turned on a boxing match, and uh, they were out there sparring around, and I wondered if they were ever going to try to connect and just sparring around. But the Lord our God comes through like this. <laughs> he has set almighty power in action. The saving strength of his right hand then, that's one more step, is the miraculous effects brought about by the almighty power brought into action. Now, you put that all together, you're not only have, going to have not just the trust in man or man or anything else, but our trust is in Jehovah God, and it is in the power of his right hand, and not only is he able to send forth a punch to the enemy, <laughs> come on, but he is able to bring about the miraculous effects that we have made of uh, in our lives, whatever it is that we have made of. So, what do you do when you're surrounded by the enemy? That was David's dilemma. What do we do when we're surrounded by the enemy? David was filled up with expectation. Somebody say, I have an expectation. And it's covered. Hallelujah. Because David trusted in God, not in the ability of man. He wasn't trusting in his armies. He wasn't trusting in the horses. He wasn't trusting in the chariots. Let's read some more of this very scripture in verse 7. Because David had this expectation from God and of God. He and his men, his officers, began to exult in the praises of the Lord their God as follows. Hear this. Some trust in horses. <laughs> some in chariots, that we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, let the King hear us when we call. Hallelujah. Yes. Woo. Now that's a powerful scripture. Some trust. In their chariots and in their horses, the, the Egypt and the, the uh, uh, armies that were against them of Syria, and, and and here they came and they were in their chariots and drawn by swift horses. But David said, "I don't stand on my trust for the horses and the chariots because I know my God knows how to take chariots." Hallelujah. Hello. Anyone here? He did it before, he can do it again. Remember that? They were drowned in the Red Sea because God just took the chariot wheels off. See, you can't trust the chariots. Their wheels will fall off. <laughs> Hallelujah! So they knew in whom they trusted. They knew. David and his men knew. Second Timothy 1, 9-12. Who has saved us? And called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, 
who has abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to life through the gospel? Where to I have appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles for the which cause I also suffer these things? Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. The apostle saith, that I know what it's like to be in prison. I know what it's like to be thrown in jail for doing good. Here's what he ends up with. I'm not ashamed. For I know in whom I have believed. <laughs> Somebody say, I know in whom I have believed. So in whom do we trust? We trust in the Lord our God, Jehovah. Hallelujah. Praise and let's go on. He which I have committed unto him against that day shall glory. Hallelujah. Keep. To keep what I've committed to his hands. We put into his hands things we can't believe. And so he keeps it. What does that mean? He, he watches God. He guards it. He keeps watch. He hovers over it. He guards David's enemies, the Amphites, the Syrians. They came against him. Swift horses, strong chariots, many of them. Yet David praises. Yet he praises. Second Samuel 10. But we have Jehovah in the name of our Lord. <laughs> but we have Jehovah and we have the name of the Lord. So it doesn't matter how swift the horses are, how stout the chariots are. It doesn't matter how many is in the opposition. God is God and he is greater. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. He knew that Jehovah his God was more than a match for all of his foes. And in him, he trusts with confidence. Well, I'm here to tell you today, I'm here to give you some kind of cheer. <laughs> you get the best cheer out of the message of God. It doesn't come in a bottle. Hallelujah. <laughs> it comes mixed with the power of the Most High God. And God has it. Hallelujah. In whom do we trust? David said, I trust in Jehovah, my God, my strength, my soul, my deliverer, who in my passion. I read a little story, and uh, I, I thought about it, and, and, and I just want to share this story with you. He's got a really talented young man. He knew how to take pictures. He knew how to get into the middle of the biggest fight and the biggest fires and the biggest of everything and get the greatest of pictures. And so there was this magazine that, that, that called him up and said, we want to hire you, young man, to go out to the Yellowstone National Park uh, and take pictures of the fires that's going on and how the firemen are being such so heroic and down there in doing all that they do in bringing these fires to an end. And he said, yes, sir, I'm at your command. So he got on board his plane and he went out to California and he got ready to uh, take pictures. He got out into the close to the fire and he realized there was too much smoke. There was too much denseness. You couldn't see what was happening. He said, ah, I know what to do. I need an airplane. So he put his trust in an airplane. And he called back to the, the a magazine and said, can't see anything on the ground. I need an airplane. I need to go up and over to get some aerial shots, and we'll be able to see what's going on. They said, fine. Go to the airport. We'll have a, an airplane ready for you. It will be fueled up, and, and uh, you can take that up and fly over and get your aerial shots for our, our cover story that we're doing. So he did that. He raced to uh, uh, a, a vehicle to get him out to the airport. And there at the airport, he saw this little uh, prop job sitting out there on the tarmac and, and uh, uh, all filled up. And evidently, he appeared to be. And there was a youngest looking man, young, young guy, sitting at the wheel as a pilot. And so this, this uh, uh, photographer just threw his cameras into the, the back and climbed in and uh, said, well, let's go. So 
the very way. Off they went. And they got up in the air, and it was really shaky. It was really bumpy. And the young man said, the pilot, how was that? He said, that was great. And so, the pilot was really nervous. The little plane lifted higher and higher, and it just kept jumping around. And this young talented photographer, though, he didn't really expect such a jerky ride and hoped he would be able to get his pictures with that jerkiness. And he expected, well, it's just the wind and that's causing that. And so the, the uh, photographer said, I want you to fly over now, fly over the fires, and get as close as you can and let me get some shots on the on the set. Why? The young man said, because I am on assignment and I've got to get pictures for the cover story for the magazine of all that they're doing in this fire down here. The pilot of this plane finally broke his silence and he said, oh, I thought you were the flight instructor. Uh -huh. But a dilemma. He trusted in an airplane set on the tarmac. He asked no questions. Evidently, he didn't pray before he left. <laughs> he didn't ask for any guidance because he didn't get any. Hello. In this life, we have to ask some pertinent questions especially of uh, what goes on in this world. Are you listening? Yeah. Are you a pilot or are you a student pilot? Would have been a really good question to have asked. And not to have put his trust into this airplane with a student pilot. All right, but what about with God? We can trust God, yes. but there's very little in this world that we can absolutely trust yes. without God. Amen. Are you listening? Amen. Whatever the doctor says, I need God. Amen. Whatever somebody says to me, I need God. Yes. However I am treated, I need God. Whatever the boss says out on your job, you need God. Yes. Whatever you encounter in this life, you need God. And we need to trust Him. Yes. And when we go to Him and we rely our whole being upon Him, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. This young man was leaning on his own understanding and he jumped on board a plane he wasn't supposed to deal with. Are you listening? There was probably a whole lot better plane sitting out there on the tarmac with an absolute pilot in it, ready to take him up. But he missed the boat. <laughs> you listening? I don't want to miss the boat. I want to trust God with all my heart. And you know, there are times in my life we absolutely trust Him more than in others because we go through things and we have to trust Him or we aren't going to make it. And then there are other times when life gets easy and we just kind of slide along. Oh, life is good. Hello. But if we trust the Lord at all times and lean not to our own understanding, He's going to establish our ways and He's going to protect us in our going and He's going to help us in every step of the way. And no matter what comes our way, we're going to be able to hold up underneath it because God is with us. Hallelujah. With and in God, you can trust. He never makes mistakes. Never. Yes. He hasn't made a mistake in your life. We sometimes make mistakes, but he never makes any. But he forgives us for our mistakes. Isn't yes. that wonderful? Yes. 
We suck up and he, we come back to him and he says, I forgive. I forgive. He wants us to call upon him and to lean upon him and to know that he is there for us. So trust him with everything in us because he never makes a mistake. Anyone here have a bill phone? Anyone here have a dollar bill? Or coin? Or anything else called currency or money? What is it say? In God we trust. In God we trust. In God we trust. Do we? Yes. I say yes. Hallelujah. I say Unanimously, yes, we trust him because he is the one we can trust. Life has a lot of people, a lot of things that cause them to be less trust, trusting, less trusting because they've been hurt, because they've been, things have happened. Because of various dilemmas. And I've known people to even Blame God because of a, a death in the family. And we have had so many of those, haven't we all? And we see those, and with the COVID, and, and with the, that, that which has happened recently in friends that we know of, it breaks your heart that that has to happen. But folks, I still trust in God. I still trust you. Because I know that any one of my friends or family that goes on, that they're going to have a place in the heart of my God. Hallelujah. That they're going to be at peace at home with my God. And everything's going to be alive. Hurts for us. But our money in the United States of America says, in God we trust. I thought about that and I went after some history. And God we trust. It's the official motto of the United States. Did you know that? The official motto of the United States of America. Thank God. What did it say? Thank God. It goes back to the Civil War. With the outbreak in 1861. You know Abraham Lincoln, a Republican. <laughs> fought for the our beautiful friends of the African persuasion that live here. Fought for them to be free and I thank God for that. Abraham Lincoln, a Republican, did that. Hallelujah. Yes, Take me off Facebook if you want to, Facebook. <laughs> but I'm telling you the truth. But now, back to me, God, we trust. In our what, what concern, a Pennsylvania preacher <laughs> encouraged the placement of in God we trust on coins that the Lord has not said, listen from, in order, well, you got to hear this, in order to help the North's cause so they could win. In God we trust. To be placed on those coins in order for the union to win. Are you here? Well, I know we're from the South and we were the Confederate part, if we were even alive at that time, which we weren't. 1861 would have been all that. <laughs> Let me tell you something. He said, such language, this is what this man, this man the preacher, said. He said, such language would place us openly under the divine protection of God. Did you get that? Such language would place us openly under the divine protection of God. Somebody say, in God I trust. In God I trust. Hallelujah. I, mean, I saw that and I went, whew, that's good stuff. So in 1955, Dwight B. Eisenhower, who might remember, not dating himself, just saying, 
Now remember, Dwight D. Eisenhower signed a bill placing the phrase on all American currency. One sponsor of that legislation was a man called Charles Bennett, a congressman. He echoed the sentiments that had inspired the sovereignty of God back in the Civil War. Then it proclaimed that the United States was founded in a spiritual atmosphere and with a firm trust in God. Hallelujah. The next year, in God we trust, was adopted as the first official motto of the United States. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Personally, I don't trust in the United States. That doesn't mean I don't love it. I do. I love my country. But I don't trust in the United States of America so much as I trust in God. Amen. There you have it. Hallelujah. God first. God first. Hmm. Many of my own ancestors come to this country many, many, many years ago. Suffered a lot of hardship in order to get away from the oppressive rule against Christianity in the old country. I had one such member whose nose was split, whose ears were cut off many, many, many years ago. That's terrible. But in America, we can still trust in God. And I will trust in God Amen. forever. But they came to this country to serve Jesus Christ with peace. And I thank God for that. That is powerful. As for me, I will trust in God. Is anyone else with me? Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Isaiah 31 and 1, both of them that go down to Egypt for help. And stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many, and in, and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither do they seek the Lord. That is reproving the Jews here again for their confidence in Egypt. He said, why would you put your confidence in another nation? Why would you do that and not have your confidence in the Lord your God? They had placed confidence in Egypt. They also contrasted with their neglect of the power and Protection of God. You see that in verse 1 through 3. All earthly resources. Everything in this life is vanity. Everything, every single thing in this life is vanity, but God is strong and sure and powerful. His right arm has the strength not only to carry through, but to bring forth the miraculous things that we have need of at any time of which we do need them. Hallelujah. God calls to them to trust his immutable character and his faithfulness. Trust me. And when they stop trusting all the earthly arts of flesh, God sends salvation from his own presence. And so always we're leaning over and trusting. I could do this thing all by myself. I remember my mother listening to a song like that when I was a little bitty girl. I hated that song. <laughs> because I could do this thing all by myself. Now she had to be a strong woman to raise three kids. She had to be strong. She didn't do it by herself. She did it with God's help because she raised me that way. God will fight for you if you will turn to Him and trust Him. He'll be a mighty fighter for you. Isaiah 31 and 4, but that's how the Lord spoken unto me like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey. When a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. As birds flying over, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will conserve it. God will fight for you, he said. 
Isaiah 42, 13, the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, war, and he shall prevail against his enemies. And he has over and over and over. Hosea 11 and 10, they shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west, the enemies. You listen? Yes. You can't win without him, and you can't lose with him. Amen. You ask Israel. Amen. Six day war. <laughs> mm hmm. He was with them. Still is. You can't win without him, and you can't lose with him. It's a man by the name of Charles Finney. Have you ever heard of him? Charles Finney. You may have heard about him in a sermon sometime. But he was a great evangelist, very much like unto Billy Graham. Or Billy Graham was very much like unto him in his ability and outreach. Most know Charles Finney's saying. But have you ever heard of Daniel Nash? And a little known, unheard of man whose cemetery plot is right up next to the Canadian border. Not many have heard of him. Charles Finney is the name of everyone. He was a former lawyer turned preacher by the will of God. He was one of the key figures of the Second Great Awakening. Where people came to God virtually over and over and over. The 19th century revivals touched people in every aspect of life. Then he is sometimes called America's foremost evangelist or revivalist, they called him back then. In the seven years that he was an evangelist, there were estimated 500,000 conversions, salvations. 500,000. It's powerful in the seven years. Wow. His ministry in Rochester, New York, from 1830 to 1831, has been called the greatest year of spiritual awakening in American history. Someone did a follow up and found that 80% of the people they thought so stayed saved and walked with God and very closely. It's extraordinary. By anyone's standard, that is extraordinary. If you ask Charles Finney, why did he have this amazing harvest? How did he have such a stupendous revival outreach? How did that happen? He would point, Finney would point to one man, his name is Daniel Nash, whom God called. And he came to Finney, and he said, God called me to be a prayer warrior for souls in this ministry. He joined himself to Finney for the purpose of prayer. Never was seen. But Finney was invited to speak in a city. Nash would arrive three to four weeks ahead of time. He would get a room and he would call in like-minded Christians that wanted to pray. And they would start praying two to three weeks before revival began. And they would plead with God and they would, they would travail before God. It was so much so that one, one woman met Brother Finney uh, about uh, just a couple of days before three days before the revival began. And she said, I'm really worried that do you know what Daniel Nash? And he said, oh, yes, I do know him right now. And she said, I, I think you need to come. He said, there's been this awful wailing coming from this room, and it has been going on for days. And it's nonstop. And he said, don't worry about it. They're travailing in prayer. Nash didn't go to the services when the revival began. He and the prayer warriors continued praying every day, every night for souls to be born into the kingdom. Folks, prayer is trusting in God. Yes. Not ourselves. Yes. Prayer is trusting in God to do a work that we can't do. Amen. 
come up. They come up thousands of miles together in prayer and confirmation of the gospel, although Nash never stepped foot on the stage, never was seen, was always behind the, the lines on his knees in prayer. Then in the winter of 1831, Nash got ill. On December 20th of that year, while he was on his knees in prayer, he went home to be with God. He went out of this life exactly in his calling. He died at the age of 56. And he would say, oh, if only I had more strength to cry out, to pray, to ask God for another soul. He said, well, his name should have been the one that we know. He didn't want to be known. He only wanted to be next to God, calling on him, crying out to him, praying toward him for one more soul. At the end of his life, he was praying more and more and more, and he just couldn't get enough of the closeness with God. And crying out for souls. He would take a map of the world before him, and he would pray and look over the different countries and pray for them until he expired in his room. And he went home to meet God, doing what he was called to do. That's pretty powerful. He never had a line mark. He never saw a stage. He never got accolades from anyone that he should have in hell because he believed in the power of praying together and trusting God. In whom do you trust? The greatest reward we'll ever get is when we meet him. I said, meet our Lord, our Savior who gave it all for us. He trusted God. I want to trust God. This story you can find in Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. So a lot of places you find stories about these great men of God. But who was great? God. Not man. I can't trust in man. I can trust in God. You too. I present you, God, but you can't worship me. I'm just a pastor. You can love me and I appreciate your love. And I want you to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your life and with everything within you to love you and let him love you back. Nash believed God for souls to come in. He didn't trust many to preach so great. That might have been a downer. <laughs> He, he was a great prayer, but let me tell you why he was a great orator and man of God. Because of prayer. Because one man said, I will pray until I pray my whole life out. There's another story told about Alexander the Great. I did my, my thesis on Alexander the Great. Someone came to him and asked for financial help, financial aid. Alexander told the man to go to his treasurer and ask for whatever he needed and he'd get it. A little later, the treasurer went to Alexander, the treasurer, and he said, you know, I don't trust this man. He's asked for way too much money. Hmm. It was an enormous amount, he said. Alexander said, give him what he asked for. He has treated me like a king in his asking, and I shall be like a king in my giving. Hallelujah. And I shall be like a king in my giving. That's it. See, that's it. Treat him king of kings that he truly is. We trust him with all of our heart. He sees that. He knows that. And he loves you right back. For 
when we treat him like a king in our trust, in our love, in our prayers, in our talking to him, our conversations with him, and our walking with him, and our giving, and our doing, and our, our loving him, he said, I shall be like a king in my giving unto you. I saw that and it struck a chord inside of me. You hear? It struck something deep down inside. And I said, that's it. We get back what we give them to him. Do you give 100% of your heart? Oh, thank you, Lord. You're so I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you. You're awesome, God. You are awesome, God. And he in turn gives us what a king of kings, king gives. Because he has more to give than we have to give. Hmm. And what he gives is glorious, is wonderful, is love. If you feel lonely, he's there. <sighs> Trust him. Have a firm belief in the reality, reliability, truth, ability, or enormous strength of God because we are in his safe keeping and care. Trust, trust him, talk to him, tell him all about it, talk it over. We'll talk it over in the blind mind. All those old songs from way back just roll up in my spirit. Talk to him, tell him all about it, talk it over. Treat him as a king of the law kings. How do we treat him? Good morning. Hello? Turn it to him at all times. Good and bad, whatever it is. Then we take up our cross and we follow him. And it's powerful. It's the best life. It's the most wonderful. You talk about a wonderful life. <laughs> Christmas story doesn't have a match to God and his story. <laughs> we take up our cross and we follow him daily. And he's there. He was there all the time. Standing faithfully in line. Oh, he's God. Trust him. This is trust God. Trust Him with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He'll give you the desires of your heart. In all your ways, trust Him. Are we in love with what He has given us? in this life to be or to do. He's given us all beautiful families. I'm in love with that. That's family. You guys are all family too. I mean, we have a relatively small family in our immediate circle. But we got a big family on the outside. The outside. I don't like to lose one. <laughs> Hello. I'm going to hang on with all my heart and all my strength. But are we in love with what he has given us? Do we do it joyfully? Yes. I come to church joyfully because I get to preach to you. If there was one of you, I would joyfully preach the word to you. Because of call. A call. So if one comes, I guess that's God's plan. Or if it's a gazillion. Just let God's work be done in you. Do it joyfully. As unto the Lord. 
Everything you do, you're teaching children, do it as unto the Lord, and let your godly spirit just flow out of your mind. They feel it. They know. They, children, children, they feel God. I would do it now. Do it joyfully. If it's praying, pray with all your heart. If you're a travailer, travailer over the things that God wants around you in this life. Or maybe it's on the other side of the country, of the world. He knows all about it. Pray. Talk to your neighbors. Some, some of you have that gift of gab. Talk to people. Tell them about how good it feels to have the Lord in your life. Be who God created you to be. Final. Be who God created you to be. And he can be trusted. In this life, you may not have trusted some people, but you can trust God. With all of your heart, you can trust him. You can lean back on him. And whatever he says, he'll do it. God bless you. We're going to come to the Lord in prayer now. We're going to talk to him about putting all of our care and our trust over on him. And he's going to speak to our hearts. What is it that he wants you to do more than anything else in the world? What is it that you desire more than anything? He, he said he'd give you the desires of your heart. Don't be afraid to call upon him, to cry out to him. He hears you. You may not have seen exact, I mean, a lot of times we get reimbursed in many ways in the friendship of someone that might not have been your friend that was in love from someone unexpected. But trust God. And he'll bring it to pass. Father, we come right now. We thank you for your word. We thank you because you are right here, right now. You're helping every one of us to be a better, a better citizen of heaven. A better child of the most high God. A trusting child. Trusting. A trustworthy father. And right now, we give it all to you. Let me just say right now, if you're here, if you're listening to if under the sound of my voice at any time, I don't care if you're listening to this 10 weeks from now, but you're hearing something and you need Jesus, then you call upon him and he will hear and answer you. Call upon him. Ask him, Lord, forgive me of all of my sin. Forgive me. I want to be a child of the Most High God. Forgive me as I reach out to trust a trusting, trustworthy God. Be in my life. Help me. Help me to help someone else. Let me be a light to someone else. Help me to be what you would want me to be today. In God, I trust. It isn't in whom do I trust. It's in you, oh God, that I trust. I trust in you. We trust in you. And tell him that. We trust in you. I trust in you, O oh God. And I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. And cast them away from me that I might be remembered in your book of life when that day of all days comes. That my name will be called. That I might walk into heaven and be a part of that glorious place. Let my name be written in the Lamb's Book of Life today, in Jesus' name. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, who died on the cross for me. And I receive it right now. I receive it. I receive salvation. Tell him I receive your salvation over me. For I am now a child of the Most High God. He's my King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I receive you today. In the name of the Lord Jesus, someone say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Now we speak over those that have 
physical needs and a need for healing in their body. I speak a miracle to flow through these waves, Lord. That someone receives a miracle from you today. A miracle working God, Jehovah Rapha. Oh, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Mm. You said, Lord, that healing, healing, in your name and healing is there for us right now. We receive that miracle touch. Tell him right now. I receive that miracle touch right now. Completely flowing through me in Jesus' name. Somebody shout glory. Glory. Amen and amen. God bless you. We're going to say bye to those in our stream. We're glad that you were with us. This may have been lengthy. You haven't even been able to see a Oh, no, I'm going to let you out early. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention, but God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday night. We will have some this Wednesday night.